there is another question. Rather than using, so far we were using LSTMs or recurrent neural networks or GRUs all the time. The question is, can you use convolutions? Why convolutions? Because modern hardware like GPUs, they like to process things in parallel. So they are really good at that. The problem with LSTMs is that they are sequential, both in time and if you have stacks of LSTMs, they are sequential to go from one layer to the next layer, both in time and in space, you need to know the output of the previous layer. So they are sequential in nature, but we know that convolutional neural networks, they're highly parallelizable and they're good and they're gonna fit uh, GPUs and TPUs and other modern uh, uh, chips, okay? So there is a trend in the literature towards going towards uh, using more using these computing resources more efficiently. That's why you're gonna go towards, LS, towards uh, convolutional neural networks and just try to see what's gonna come out of it. Can you use convolutions for sequence to sequence modeling? I'm gonna break down this figure, so don't worry about it. Uh, I'm gonna go through every single detail, but first of all, the figure is gonna start from up there. So we're gonna start from here. Then we're gonna continue from here and then we're gonna merge the two. So this is the encoder part, that's the decoder part. And then we are gonna do some attention and then output the translation. So that's how you're gonna read this figure from up to down, from down to up, and then you merge the two. First of all, position embedding. You have a source sentence, this is X, they agree something. So that's your input elements, that's your X. These are numbers, okay? These are one, two, three, and uh, these numbers cannot have values bigger than your dictionary or dictionary size. Okay, they might, they might appear multiple times. So this is exactly what you have. These are numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. Then you're gonna first embed them to a embedding matrix. So this is always the first layer of whatever that you do with natural language. You first embed your words. You're gonna have an embedding matrix it's going to have the size of your vocabulary and F is a hyperparameter that you choose. And each word embedding is going to be a vector. It's going to be F dimensional. So that's our words. There is a problem here. With recurrent neural networks, you know there is, a, there is an order. You know what is left, what is right, and how you're going to go from one word to the next word. So there is some counting process going on naturally. You first process the first word, then you process the next word, etc. But when you do convolutions, everything is gonna be in parallel. So you're gonna send, lose the sense of ordering, okay? To bring the sense of ordering back, you're gonna have a position embedding. So you're gonna have vectors for each number in your sequence. The first word is gonna have its own vector. The second word is gonna have its own vector. Actually, the second location, the second position. The third position is going to have its own vector, etc. Okay, that's going to give you, and these are learnable parameters, the same way that you had embedding, word embeddings, and you were turning numbers, one, two, three, four, five, etc., to vectors. You're going to change one, two, three, four, five for indices of the locations or positions to vectors, and they're going to have the same size as WJ. Now, how do you bring the sense of order back? You just add them together. This is your E, so I gave you what is X. Now I need to give you what is E, and E is just the word embedding plus the position embedding. So that's bringing the order back to convolutions. That's one part. You do exactly the same thing. Now I'm here. You need to take a look at your target sentence, and then you need to turn it into G. We had X, we turned it into E. Now you have Y, you need to turn it into G. And you do the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. You're just renaming y, x to be y, okay? And e to be g. So it's exactly the same thing. Now the question is, what is this h and what is this z? How do you model it? How do you use convolutions? So this is where the convolution is gonna come in. And these are convolutions. And there is a minor difference between the encoder and the decoder. The encoder is symmetric. So it's looking at the words to the right and left. The decoder is asymmetric. It's only allowed to look at the words on the left, okay? So that's the output 
of the else block. So you're gonna have multiple convolutions on top of each other. This figure is showing only one of them, but you can stack multiple convolutions. You're gonna have else block for the encoder, else block for the decoder, and these are the notations, H and Z. So this is H, that's your Z. What is a block? It's a convolution followed by a nonlinearity. And we're gonna have stacks of these convolutional blocks. What is a convolution? Somebody gives you an input of uh, E's or G's, and that's gonna be, let's call it X. They're gonna be D-dimensional, and you're gonna have uh, K words that you're processing. Maybe you're processing P, they, and agree. So these are three. So K could be three, and D could be F. But I'm keeping it general. It's a general notation because in the next layer, you could be changing your dimension. Maybe it's no more f, it could be another dimension, okay? What you're gonna do is you just flatten them. So convolutions are very easy. You first flatten them, and then you do matrix vector multiplication. So you're gonna matrix, you're gonna multiply a matrix by your vector and a bias. And your matrix is gonna have the size of 2D by KD, because the size of X is KD. And why 2D? This is where this, gated linear units are gonna come in. In the end, you're gonna have a 2D vector per each one of these uh, outputs. You divide them into A and B. Now A is D-dimensional, B is D-dimensional, and AB, which is Y, is gonna be two-dimensional, 2D-dimensional. Two you take A, you take B, B, you push it through a sigmoid function, and then you multiply these two together. That's your nonlinearity, that's your activation function and it's called gated linear units. So that's your nonlinearity. One of them goes through a sigmoid and then you multiply them element-wise. So now we are here and we are here. It's symmetric, you are doing the same thing. You add residual connection. We know that residual connections are important. We saw it in the first paper, in the previous paper. Uh, the problem is in the end, you need to output this, so this is going from one layer to the next layer, L minus one to the next layer L, and you're adding your residual connection. But then for prediction, you need to predict the number of words, the size of the number of words in your dictionary. And uh, so you multiply by a matrix, you correct the size, and then you push it through softmax. So this we have been doing forever in this course. So there is no attention yet. If you stop here, there is no attention. We can just output your probabilities and game over. We know that attention is important. So we are gonna bring it back. Let's take a look at this H here. This H, the ith entry is gonna pay attention or how much it's gonna pay attention to the rest of the entries in your input, to the rest of Zs. So for each one of these, you want to know how much attention and you have an, at, at, an attention budget of one that you're spreading among the vector Z or the sequence Z. First of all, there is a minor modification. You are not, you are not gonna process H, you're gonna process D instead. So you had an embedding for G, you don't want to forget the ordering and your initial word vectors per each layer of your network, so you just keep adding them. You first correct the size of H, and now they are in a good form to be added, so you add them together. Otherwise, you cannot just add them. So you need to change the dimension with some parameters. These AIs are exactly these values that you're seeing here. These are your attentions. How much state I is gonna pay attention to a state J. Now we want to pay attention to these Zs and you can have uh, multiple blocks. So you could be counting, U is very similar to L. So that's your L block or it could be youth block. How do you spread your attention? You multiply the vector D that is coming out of H. You multiply it by the vector Z. It's gonna give you a number. You push it through softmax and it's gonna give you values from zero to one that add up to one. Okay, we created this dot product. Now we need to spread the attention among the input Z. So you can just multiply these numbers, these attentions, by Z, the encoded Zs from the encoder. But there is another thing that you need to do. You don't need to forget the ordering. 
So you just bring back your embedding. The same way that you brought back G here, so G was here, the same way you are bringing back E. So you don't want to lose the ordering from one layer to the next layer. And that's it. That's going to give you the disease. This summation that you see here is exactly this summation. That's going to give you a bunch of Cs. You add C to H. This is the addition. It's going to give you a bunch of a sequence of vectors. Now that sequence of vectors is the one that you're going to multiply by a matrix and then push it through softmax to give you your probabilities of the next word. How does it perform in terms of blue score? From English to Roman, it's doing the best. And we know that byte pair encoding is also very important. So we're going to use that. It's convolutional sequence to sequence with byte pair, byte pair encoding. Then uh, from English to German, it's even beating Google's neural machine translation, this convolutional neural network. And it's also beating uh, Google's neural machine translation for English to French. I think I'm finishing right on time. For those of you who want to stay and ask questions, I'll be around. And if anybody wants to leave, you are more than welcome to leave. I have a, a quick question. Sure. Um, I just, I feel like I've gotten a little confused between this, some of the math in this diagram here. Um, so this like in the diagram, this upper portion up to sort of Z is our encoder. Yes. And then the, the way the diagram makes it look is that we also have this input Y, um, but Y we would obtain from our encoder, correct? So Y, you're gonna, what do you mean? Where is Y coming from, I guess, is my question. Oh, so for prediction, you are doing one word at a time. For, first of all, for training, you know Y. You know pairs of X and Y, correct? Okay, okay, yeah. So you know everything. For training, you know X, you know Y, so you can encode Y, you can encode X. There is a minor catch. When you're encoding your Y, you are not allowed to look into the future words. And we're going to respect that. We're going to look at only the words on the left. So it's a one-sided convolution. Okay, so, and yep. the training is going to get done. Okay. Encode it. You encode X, you encode Y, you pay attention, and then you output the sequence. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's done. For prediction, once these parameters are learned, what you're going to do is you, you know X entirely. You do your, you know Y up until some point because you are translating one word at a time. Okay, so you know why up until some point and you're going to keep that, you're going to encode it and then you're going to pay attention. There is no training going on and you're, you're going to predict the next word. So you don't need to predict everything. You're just going to predict the next word. So it is the first prediction. It's actually here. So it's going to predict this word. These words you already predicted. ZS, Tim and Zoo, you already predicted and this is the end of sentence that you need to predict next. And then when you predict the first word of the output, are you not using any sort of... Yes, so you're you going to have the previous you're gonna have information. The, you're going to have the beginning of the sentence. That's your token. The, the, like, just like an indicator that it's the beginning of the sentence. Yes, so it's very similar to what you have here. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Or it's so. the end of the sentence from the source sentence. Okay? Yeah, so there's sort of more computation that's going on as you get more information as you build up like more. Actually, the X part is the same. So there is no additional computation going on there. Yeah, but you'd get more uh, computation from this Y encoding. Yes, so you're gonna have more of that. Okay. Because you just unraveled a new word in your translation. So you're right. I had one other question. I don't know if anyone else wanted to ask a question, um, but I, I was gonna ask about sequence lengths as for inputs to these convolution networks and whether uh, is that sequence length static? Um, do they have like a known, like all, does that make sense? Like either it's padded or truncated to fit that static sequence length? So if you look at this architecture, this is uh, fully convolutional. Okay, yeah. And, and we know that convolutions, they don't depend on the sequence length yep. because you're sharing parameters and then you're just sliding it. And this is exactly what we were doing for uh, classification as well, okay? Yeah. And you asked the same question back then also. Uh, if your sentence is very short, then you might get into trouble. But mm -hmm. even that, you can do padding. 
yeah on some site but that's a good question during training because you want to use your gpus more efficiently so the way that the training works for languages is that you're gonna batch together sentences of the same length mm. and then process them in batches that makes sense that's going to improve the performance during training okay I think I ran into a problem related to that with this week's mm -hmm. report um, and, and fixing the sequence length at like a static size seemed to help. But I, I think the, that also batching them together would have helped as well. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And the other thing is that you can actually pad as much zeros as you want. So it's just going to ignore them. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. not going to show up in your computations at all. Mm -hmm. It's just a bunch of zeros getting multiplied. Thank you. Yep.